So welcome everybody. This is the National Garden Bureau's Ask the Experts About Butterflies and, I mean, sorry, Ask the Experts About Budlia and Other Plants for Butterflies. Um, we have our experts with us today. I will briefly introduce you and then each of you can um, introduce yourselves. I'm sure you'll do a better job than what I will. So we have Laura from Walters Gardens. We have Natalie from Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, and we have Linda, and she is going to be talking to us about butterfly candy budlia and a few other things, as they all will. So let's see, I'll toss it back to you, Laura. Tell us about yourself and Walters Gardens. Yeah, hi. So I am a regional product manager for Walters Gardens uh, covering the Northeast. And Walters Gardens is a perennial uh, wholesale company. We're based out of West Michigan. Uh, we've been around uh, since the 1940s and we started with bare root. We do a bunch of bare root and young plant production. Um, and we are a partner with Proven Winners. Um, so we work closely with Natalie's company and with other companies that are involved with Proven Winners um, to supply the perennial portion of the Proven Winners program. Um, but Budlia are a shrub, so we do not provide those to the program. Okay, Natalie. Hi there. Uh, my name is Natalie Carmoli, and uh, I do I work for Spring Meadow Nursery, which is about forty minutes from Walters Gardens. We are the exclusive grower for Woody Ornamentals for the Proven Winners brand. We go under the name Proven Winners Color Choice, and yes, we grow the Woody variety of butterfly bush and budlia. A lot of what we'll talk about today, as long as well as about three hundred other varieties. So we're real busy here in spring and excited to get going in a, a new gardening year. As we all are, great. <laughs> and Linda. My name is Linda Vauder. I garden here in Oklahoma City. I'm a garden personality, I guess, and I produce media for all sorts of different platforms. Um, I'm a spokesperson for um, the Southern Living Plant Collection and Butterfly Candy, Candy Butterfly, and uh, Better Boxwood. And I recently wrote a couple of books, The Elegant and Edible Garden and the Five-Year Garden Journal. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So here's how we're going to do this today. I see a lot of people in the chat talking about where they're from, which is wonderful. Um, we will hopefully have something for everybody, no matter where you're located. And I have a few questions to begin. We're kind of doing this in three parts, just some generalities about butterflies and, you know, all their favorites and what they like and how we can attract them um, in our garden. And I know, Linda, you would be able to talk a little bit about designing for butterflies. So that's great. Then we've got um, a little PowerPoint presentation where we'll show you some varieties of budlia and additional plants that are good for butterflies. And then we'll circle back in the end and we'll talk some more specifics on how to grow with budlia. So with that, um, does anybody wanna just kind of jump in about some of the best ways to attract butterflies to your garden? Let's start very general. Sure, I'll lead off, I guess. Um, I think one of the main things to think about is all the different things that butterflies are gonna need. So um, to not just focus on one aspect of that, but the fact that they're gonna need nectar sources, um, they're also going to need host plants for their larval caterpillar stage to feed on. Um, you're going to want things that are going to be blooming, you know, season long so that you continuously have different nectar sources. Uh, but then some things that people don't think about is that they need resting spots. Um, so a lot of times, especially if it's cooler in the mornings, they need kind of a sunny flat area to, uh, you know, open up their wings and warm them up for the day. Um, and butterflies also like um, puddling areas where they can drink water. Um, and a good way to provide that if you don't have a natural source is to put like a little dish just with some sand in it um, and some water where they can not be, you know, standing in deep water, but suck up water from the puddles. Anything to add? No, I think, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. I um, And we'll have so many questions like this, right, where people are like, uh, are Budlia a, a great, you know, are they the best thing for butterflies? Well, they're like just 
have, if you had a sandwich and all you had was bread, right? There's so many, it's, you know, it's just like Laura said, there are so many uh, sources of nourishment and um, so many stages in their life cycle where they need all of these different things to survive. So planting nectar rich flowers, uh, different kinds of flowers, you know, milkweed and cone flowers and lantana are all really great to mix in with your um, butterfly bushes. And as well as things that are going to bloom at different times, butterfly bushes will start a little later. We always like to say they press the snooze button on spring. So because they bloom a little later, having things that bloom earlier too, to get them started in the season is a great idea. And Linda, do you want to add something about um, combining things as far as putting different plants together? Oh, you're muted, Linda. My connection, so I apologize. Um, I think one of the things that I love about any kind of pollinator gardens is that they make garden in, gardening in general so much more experiential. You know, it's not just um, a beautiful display. It's very interactive. It's lively. It's very sensual. And I think that I think that is a layer of gardening that is above and beyond just the beauty and the practicality of it. It's so, it's very life affirming. And I think it's really a wonderful way to entice young gardeners into, into the garden and teach them about, you know, natives and the importance of things. And I think that it's not just about beauty, but it's, it's about interactivity too. Yeah, good point. Yeah, we all we all love to uh, be out in our garden and see the butterflies flitting around. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so there there was a question right away here. Um, not sure if this is a question for an entomologist, but what's the maximum distance a butterfly will fly for water sources? So if you have a large garden, how many puddling areas might be needed? Well, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure either. I'm sure. Yeah, it's so hard because I don't know, you know, large garden could mean a lot of things to a lot of exactly. different people yeah, as well. Yeah. So I would say err on the side of more is better than mm -hmm. less. So make sure right. you have them there. But but I know they fly quite a distance. Right. Anybody that follows monarchs and monarch way stations can find that information really easily that way, too. I mean, if you want to find a butterfly that's going to fly a long way you know, follow monarchs. Yes, yes, this is this is very true. Um, so what about um, smells? Are there certain scents? And, and I don't know, maybe you guys will mention that in some of your variety mentions, but are, are butterflies attracted to scents? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think we're all attracted to those really luscious herbal scents, you know, lavender and rosemary. And I think what attracts us probably also attracts butterflies. Yeah, I think the butterflies can, I believe from research I've done or, you know, things I've read before that they, their sense receptors are in their antennae mm -hmm. um, and that they can smell nectar. And I don't know how much they differentiate between the different types, but I'm sure since certain species of butterflies prefer certain nectar plants uh, that they can. Um, so yeah, they do smell and use that to detect the flowers that they're looking for. And then we also had a question about um, using sugar water. You know, obviously we use that for our hummingbirds. Um, are butterflies, or can they use uh, sugar water just like a hummingbird would? Absolutely. You can supplement uh, a butterfly's nutrition with sugar water. Supplement. Um, <laughs> they're attracted to it. Um, but, uh, you know, like we said before, it's just part of the whole story and nutrition for them. But it's a great attractor, uh, just like you wouldn't only feel it, feed a Baltimore Oriole grape jelly. Um, <laughs> uh, I, it's just part of the story. But yes, great attractor. Diversity is great. Diversity in your garden, diversity mm -hmm. in food, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. that's good. Um, also, maybe I might interject. I live in an urban area and homes and gardens are pretty close together. And so obviously, while I as an individual can can 
tried to incorporate as much diversity into my garden as possible, it's also helpful to encourage your neighbors um, so that diversity can extend just beyond your own landscape, but it can it can also extend to landscapes that are nearby or contiguous wherever it is you garden. And that's one of the things we love about gardening is we can always share our knowledge and there's a lot of people hungry for knowledge too. So that's, yeah, good, great tip. Um, let's talk about regionality. Um, let's see here. So we've got two in Michigan, one in Oklahoma. Um, I'm in Chicago land, but I'm not one of the expert panelists. I'm just moderating. Um, but let's talk about regionality, not only of plants, but of different butterfly species. And how does that impact what you're planting in your garden? Well, one of the things, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's important to know what species of butterflies are in your area. And there's a lot of information on the website. You know, all of us here, I think, are um, definitely a little bit more plant focused than butterfly focused in terms of our knowledge basis. Uh, but if you go on the web, there's lots of good information about which butterfly species um, feed on which nectar sources and which of their larvae feed on which plant sources for foliage. Um, so just to make sure that you're matching those up, you know, if you're trying to focus on a species of butterfly that's not even in your region, there's no point in planting plants that will host their larvae if they're not going to be there. So you just want to keep an eye on what butterflies are going to be in your area already and make sure that you're offering the nectar sources and larval food sources that they will actually feed on. Well, one thing that's important here in Oklahoma, speaking of geography, is it's very, very difficult to garden in Oklahoma. And so sometimes we err on the side of what can we get to live? <laughs> you know, what can we get that can make it through a summer where temperatures not infrequently exceed 110 degrees? And so one of the things I love about the buddleias and some of their companion plants, you know, this, the salvias and rosemaries and, and things like that, is that they can really handle the frequent droughts that we have. They can handle the intense heat. And some of the buddleias that we'll be talking about, they can continue to bloom if deadheaded well into the heat of the summer. And so, and for a very, very long period of time, so I, I think it's so important that we know our gardens and our geography and, you know, what our thresholds are. And it may sound kind of extreme, but, but in really difficult areas, it's just what can I get to grow that will attract any kind of pollinator and doesn't create some kind of issues in terms of invasiveness or, or um, you know, getting a little bit too rambunctious in your garden. And this was not planned, but that was a perfect segue is I think we do. We're talking about Budley. It is a year of the Budley for National Garden Bureau. And I know there are a few areas in the United States that those states do have it on it, their invasive list. So maybe you guys can talk about that. We will refer everybody to a, a blog that we just wrote on the topic. Um, right plant, right place, just because it's invasive here does not mean it's invasive there. So does somebody want to, I mean, probably all three of you, um, and it looks like we've got Tim coming on soon. He's he's our other panelist. So as soon as we can get him unmuted, that's something on my end I'm doing, um, we'll add into our panelists. But if uh, if you guys want to talk about that, and let's, <clears throat> let's just... Um, talk about what is happening among the breeding world um, as far as making some of these varieties um, sterile or having a lower seed set or something. So take it away. Whoever wants to broach that, we'll let everybody speak up. I can. I can start there. Um, yeah, of course. I, whenever it comes to any invasive species, um, yes, it's very regional whether or not it's going to be particularly invasive in one part of the United States or another. Butterfly bush uh, tend to be very invasive out west. Um, and then here in Michigan, not so much. I, I, I've never 
had a butterfly bush reseed in, in my property. But we are addressing that anyway, because we want to be able to have anybody buy our butterfly bushes nationwide, right? So we start breeding for non-invasive cultivars. Uh, these cultivars um, you, sometimes will be called seedless. Sometimes they will be called uh, sterile. Um, uh, sometimes the seedless obviously means they don't produce seeds. Sterile means they produce a, a non-viable seed. Or a lot of times you'll hear um, them simply being called low seed set. Uh, we will never call a plant uh, seedless, even if it produces one seed out of you know four hundred. You know if if it's if it's the uh, plant that it's matched up with is producing 4,000 seeds and it produces one, it's not seedless anymore, even though it's completely non-invasive at that point. So we do have seedless varieties. We do have, you know, of all different kinds of plants. Um, with our Budlia, we tend to call them uh, non-invasive just because every now and then it will produce a seed. And we'll talk about those more in the uh, slideshow, but it is something we're always addressing. Oh, we are as aware as of anyone else that we don't want to create problematic plants for people to put in their in their properties. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Budlia that we have introduced uh, through Walter's Gardens uh, follows pretty much the same kind of guidelines as what Natalie was talking about, that we um, are continuously working with our breeding team on uh, developing varieties or selecting varieties that have low to to virtually no seed set. Um, we don't call any of our sterile just because in order to use that terminology, typically you would have to get them certified as such. Um, and we just haven't done that, but we call them low to little seed set. Um, and, and if you follow along with what we do in our introductions, you'll see that sometimes we replace one variety with another. And typically that is because we've found similar or better varieties that have reduced seed set. And I might add that in addition to, to those concerns, I also love the fact that so many of the, the new ones that are being bred are of a scale that is so much more befitting our home gardens and residential gardens, because um, those that have been grown formally, you know, just be massive. Um, and sometimes that is just, it's just too much. And increasingly, as some of our gardens are, are downsized, we want things that are more minimal and we want alternatives to, you know, one thing I love about any of these blooming shrub varieties is that they are, they are alternatives to seasonal color planting. So you can get seasonal color from these beautiful Budlia and they stay a manageable size. So they are great alternatives to, you know, flat after flat of, of annual color. And I think that's really important. And they, um, they just are a little bit more tame. They're lower maintenance and there's just so much to commend them. Yeah, good point. So now I'm going to um, introduce Tim. I am so sorry, Tim. I, I was trying to go over there and trying to do three things at once. So we welcome Tim from Star Roses and Plants. Tim, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm Tim Wood from Star Roses and Plants. I cover the Midwest for them. Um, been with this company for 20 years and it's been uh, uh, it's a great company to be with. And we're we're always trying to uh, look for new and interesting uh, genetics to bring to the landscape, not just roses, obviously, since we're here with uh, butterfly bush, but uh, perennials, trees and, uh, and and so on. Um, for for us on the on the sterility uh, aspect or low seed set, we certainly don't call our seedless or or sterile um, as as we get into the slides, you'll see some of the, there, there's certain characteristics in plants that we're looking for that tend to lend to low seed set, um, not necessarily sterility, but definitely low, low seed set that we're, that we're looking for uh, when we're, when we're screening our plants. And then we're taking the other step as well as we're working with universities then on, on certain varieties to go through and have them either certified or find out exactly what, uh, what level of seed they're producing and the viability of those those seeds. And we do know that Oregon is one state that is definitely battling the invasive issue. And we also know that there are some trials through Oregon State University that, um, you know, if readers so choose, they can enter those trials and really get 
that judgment back on the sterility or low seed set. I just thought I would interject that. Um, so we do want to move on to the PowerPoint, but I think um, we've got a question here that I would like to see if you guys can comment on this. Um, she says, can you comment on the quality of Buddleian nectar? I have read it's of lower quality, but still see so many butterflies on my Buddleia. So turn that one over to you guys. Well, I haven't uh, read it. Uh, go ahead, Natalie. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a problem with Buddleia nectar. Net, netker, I can't even say the word, nectar. Um, I don't think there's an issue there. I mean, if the butterflies are there and they're getting their sustenance from it um, and, and you're doing other things like feeding them sugar water, the nectar certainly isn't an issue. Is there like, are some nectars of higher quality than others? Probably, I'm not an expert at it, but um, I, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's it's uh, maybe an argument that people make that, that maybe aren't terribly fond of Budlia anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I do think it's a good food source for butterflies. Yeah, butterflies not going to come if it's not a good food source for them. And and I've been looking for the actual research, you know, like a good peer approved research, and I can't find anything from any research station, you know, from Mount Cuba or anything that really has dug in and proven that it's not good nectar. So. I'm not sure if it's, you know, an urban myth or something, but somehow that rumor got started, but there's no proof on it from what we can tell. Tim, maybe you can address this. I would think the quality of the nectar would depend so much more on the health and the vigor of the plant itself and the quality of the nectar that, that those individual flowers can, you know, can produce. So I could be wrong on that, but you know, the health and the vigor of the plant, I would think would really make a difference. I would agree. Okay. So <laughs> are we ready to talk about specific Budlio? And by specific, I mean, uh, pretty much newer varieties of Budlio. So let's see here. I have my screen here and Linda I believe you are up first so as I go through here we've got Linda's variety to talk about and then we will move on to our other panelists. Yeah and I anecdotally I have grown I think every one except for the raspberry color and I started a brand new garden last year and I could not believe how beautifully these all performed. And I love the fact that the colors I have, I again, always speak from a design perspective typically, but I love the fact that the color palettes of so many of these diminutive uh, Budlia, whether they're butterfly candy or some of the others, they really speak to, if you want that English garden look, with those English gardening colors, then they are wonderful to incorporate into your, you know, into your landscapes. I I think they're especially if you're trying to go for, oh, for example, like a Mediterranean vibe, and you want something that is really going to play up the gray tonal qualities in some of the things you plant, then all of these are wonderful for that. And they also, I think really create great synergy with other other pollinating attractors that grow in like conditions. So for example, I have um, my butterfly candy. I've grown the, the lavender and the little grape and little coconut. And I have paired those with things that just naturally want to grow here on the prairie, you know, natives. So some of our native echinacea and um, uh, lychnus and, and gay feather and some of the other natives that we grow here on the on the prairie, they just all perform and both aesthetically and practically just beautifully together. Now, I will say that one thing that I, I tried to be mindful of, and I think we all need to be mindful of when we plant these, is I don't know how it is in Michigan um, where you guys garden, but it's very, very heavy clay here. And so when I planted mine, I really wanted to ensure that they really had wonderful drainage 
And I think here in Oklahoma, we garden in the land of the extremes. So last year, it went from we had 112 degrees in the summer and we had set a record low of zero degrees here in the winter. So these plants really sailed through that um, and looked pretty good, amazingly, in the process. And so I, I think that that while they could handle those temperature extremes, one thing I don't know they could have handled if, if they really had overwintered in really cold, wet, heavy soil, because they are prone to root rot. So those are the so those are some of the the considerations, but there are just wonderful combinations that you can you know that you can come up with using perennials like coreopsis and and different lavenders and catmints and all sorts of herbs that I think are just spectacular. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, okay, next up we have Natalie um, with several of your varieties. Yeah. Hi. So let's start with the Lo and Behold series. Now, the first two series that I'm going to talk about are the Lo and Behold series and the Miss series. And we'll talk about Miss in just a moment. But the first thing I want to uh, point out about both of these is they are non-invasive. So these are the ones that have practically no seed. I dare you to find a seed on these guys. Um, they're beautiful, uh, brightly colored butterfly bushes and lots of really garden friendly sizes as well. So if we're looking at the Lo and Behold series, we've got uh, the tiniest ones, which are easy to figure out, but, but just by their name, Blue Chip Junior and Pink Microchip. Those are both one and a half to two and a half feet tall and wide. So they're a really nice petite size. You could fit them in a small container. You could put them in the front of a border. Um, Linda was right. They like to be planted in a sandy soil. They really need perfect drainage to uh, be super, super healthy. So planting them high, keeping them dry. Once they're established, they're extremely drought tolerant. Um, and these guys are a really beautiful, brightly colored, small butterfly bush. Uh, with really gorgeous full season color. Uh, our newest color is Lo and Behold Ruby Chip. You can see that all the way to the right of those three pictures there. That one's going to get to be about two and a half feet tall and wide. That's our newest color. Um, it's one that we took from Miss Ruby, which is in the Miss series. We'll talk about in a minute. Miss Ruby was such a popular color, and we wanted to bring that into the Lo and Behold series. So the one, the three you, the three you can see there. I think you're looking at Blue Chip, um, Pink Microchip, and Ruby Chip, and then we have another one called Purple Haze. That's a, a purpley color in between uh, those two pinks. All right, and this is the Miss series. So we have Miss Molly, Miss Ruby, and Miss Violet in this series. Uh, I like to provide pictures with actual butterflies. There's the proof, um, like you need it, because when you plant these guys, they're going to be flocked with butterflies. Um, around here, we see a lot of monarchs, which is really lucky. I know a lot of people are doing a really a lot of hard work to improve the monarch population, and um, we're really seeing some great evidence of that. Uh, these are a little bit bigger, still a lot smaller than size than your conventional butterfly bush. So these are probably half the size of, of a conventional butterfly bush coming in at around um, four to five feet tall and wide. That might seem big, but we've talked about those great big second story plants where you can only see the flowers from like a second story window of your house. So these are a nice compact size still, nice back of the border plant. You could layer things in front of them. They're going to bring that nice late season color to your garden. So this is the Miss series, also non-invasive. And then finally, we have the Pugster series. If you like a tiny butterfly bush, these are the guys for you. I like to say that their flowers almost look like little jester hats coming off from a really perfectly rounded, two foot tall and wide habit. So you get this really tiny, really rounded habit with full size flowers. Sometimes I'll show people a picture of my hand laying behind Pugster amethyst, which is the one all the way to the left there, that light purple velvety flower. The flower is as long as my hand. And I have, I can reach an octave and two keys playing the piano. So I've got a big hand. Um, <laughs> so we've got these giant flowers on this tiny, tiny little butterfly bush. The other thing about Pugster is 
it's got a really sturdy frame. So it's going to put up with a little more of a winter beating. Um, butterfly bushes, um, woody frame can tend to be a little brittle and break under snow. This one's a little more sturdy. That said, even though this is dwarf, two and a, like two, maybe three feet tall and wide, it needs to be pruned every year. And I say that about most butterfly bushes. You want to prune them in the spring when, um, like I said, they're going to wake up late, but you're going to see those first bunches of foliage uh, start to emerge in late summer. Prune just above on the stems of that first bunch of healthy foliage that you see. It helps keep them in shape. It helps keep them small and it helps keep those flowers down where you want to see them and not at the tippy tops of your plant, no matter what size plant you're growing. So this is the Pugster series of dwarf butterfly bushes from Proven Winners Color Choice. Thank you, Natalie. You uh, answered one of the questions that I have for later is about pruning. So thank you for, for <laughs> yeah. doing that. You <laughs> Perfect. Uh, let's hear. Uh, Tim, I think you're up now. Wonderful. Um, so we are also breeding for smaller plants, but let's get some uh, love to some of the old fashioned taller types that get about three to four foot tall, four foot wide. And this uh, kind of speaks to what we're looking for in the way of breeding and lends to uh, where where we think we have a low, uh, a pretty significant low seed set. Uh, so this is Cranras. Cranras is gonna be about four foot tall by four foot wide. One of the things that we're always looking for, like we do with roses, is continuous blooming and plants that are going to flush past the old flowers. Uh, butterfly bush tend to rest, so you'll get a good flush, and then you'll have a little bit of a slowdown, and then you'll get another flush. So the nice thing with Cranras is we're continuously pushing new flowers. So you'll get your, your first bloom, and then you have more flower buds, buds coming as well. Uh, so that's one of the qualities that we're look, looking for so that a, the homeowner is going to have flowers throughout the entire season always directing butterflies and pollinators. And then with, with our smaller plant, the Dapper series, uh, we have a pink now as well in that in, in that mix. A uh, plant that's gonna be 18 inches to two foot wide, um, white, blue, pink, and another one of those plants that if you can look at the middle middle picture, you'll see that, there you go, you see that nice big flower, Right there to the right and to the left, you're seeing new flower shoots develop right behind the old flower. So what, by the time that this flower is out of bloom and starting to rest, you're going to have new flowers developed and pushing past those old ones. So, so it's you, you can deadhead, but the beauty of the Dapper series is you don't necessarily need to because it's going to continuously be pushing flowers. One of the things that we've, we've found with rose breeding, uh, which we've been able to extrapolate into in a butterfly bush uh, uh, breeding is... If you're continuously producing flowers, you're typically not producing seed or not a lot of seed because typically those plants will, will rest. And the reason they rest is because they're putting that energy into seed. If you're continuously pushing new flowers, the plant's not using that energy to make new seed. So we've been able to kind of uh, d determine uh, low seed set plants by the amount of flower that the, the, the plant is pr producing. And that's one of the things that we look for when we're selecting new varieties. And then some of our uh, our, our small uh, um, classic varieties that we have, uh, uh, Petite Blue Heaven and Tutti Frutti. Um, these are great um, um, small 18 inch by 18 inch butterfly bush. And I'm gonna ask a question of you, Tim, and I think it's gonna be the same for all of them. Uh, basically, most of these shrubs would need full sun, correct? Most Budlia? Correct, six or more hours of sunlight. Okay. And we had had a question about zones and Natalie answered that her budlia are hardy in zones five through nine. Tim, what about yours? The same. Uh, okay. They're going to zone five. They'll die back to the ground. Like Natalie's saying, you give them a good, good uh, pruning in the spring and they're going to flush back with flowers for the summer. Okay, great. Um, Laura, I think you're up now. And it looks like we have one of the budlia breeders in one of your photos. Yeah, so if you look over on the far picture there, that is Hans Hansen, and he is our uh, lead breeder and director of new plant development. Um, and he is the genius behind um, a lot of the plants that we introduce, including these Cascade Budlia. Um, so I'll jump right into the Cascades. Uh, I absolutely love this Budlia. 
It is a larger series. It's not one that we intended to, to you know, breed down into a small pocket size. Um, as you can see, I mean, Hans is six foot tall. These plants grow to, you know, five to five and a half feet tall, depending on age and, and variety um, and the same width. But like Natalie was saying about some of the really older genetics, they're still not going to be as massive as some of the old genetics of Buddleia. And they also have been selected to have bloom coverage from top to bottom. I mean, if you look at these photos, the flowers are not concentrated at the top. They're all across the plant. Um, the the cascades, I think you have more uh, slides showing some of the other cascades, Diane. Um, yeah, back one. So the Grand Cascade was on the first slide there. And then we have three other colors, the lilac, the pink, and the violet cascade. Um, and basically all of these are selected to have cascading foliage, a cascading shape to the foliage and plant itself, and then massive panicles, which is why I really love these. These panicles are just huge. Some of them grow to 14 to 18 inches in length. So just imagine the color impact um, and the impact on butterflies. You have that many more uh, flowers and sources of nectar for them. So um, that's pretty much what the Cascade series is about, is just massive flower impact, um, and this nice arching cascading shape to the plants. Um, and then the other one that we are talking about from Walter's Gardens breeding is Prince Charming. So this is from a different series of Buddleia that we have called the Monarch series. And the Monarchs are going to be a little bit smaller than the Cascades. These are more in the four and a half to five feet range. Um, and they don't have that cascading shape. So these are more of the standard architecture that you might expect from Buddleia. Um, and Prince Charming is one that we're featuring because it is one of our customers' favorites because of the color. That bright kind of magenta pink coloration um, is just fantastic. And these are still good-sized flowers. These are going to be about 10 inches in length, uh, so not as large and long and beefy as the Cascades, but still um, a good-sized flower as well. Um, yeah, so those are what we have, I believe. Okay, thank you, Laura. And I'm going to continue on here uh, fairly quickly through these. These are some additional Budlia from other National Garden Bureau members. So we have Gold Drop. There's Butterfly Gold. So you can see the variegated leaves on that one. Funky Fuchsia. That's definitely a bright fuchsia flower on this one. Groovy Grape. Um, I, I'm not sure what people were uh, thinking on on naming these, but boy, they got some kind of hip 70s names here. Groovy Grape is another one. Psychedelic Sky. Um, this Chrysalis series, this would definitely be a compact variety that comes in five different colors. And Baby Buzz. So this one was bred to be able to be grown in hanging baskets and containers. So that's the size of that one. And then Leah Midnight Blue and Raspberry. And with that, okay, let me go back. So that is it for our Budlia. And now what we're going to do is let each one of our panelists talk about some additional plants that are really good for butterflies. So I think, Linda, you're up with the Agapanthus. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak enough to the fact, and I love what Tim said about the fact that they it's, it's just a constant show. They just repeat bloom over and over and over again. And while some of us might want to deadhead and some of us might not, I think the more we do deadhead, the more beautiful the presentation of the plant. And it really then accentuates some of the companion plants that much more. So at the time I planted lots of the uh, butterfly candy, I also planted a whole different myriad of, of different kinds of agapanthus. And talk about a show. I mean, you could barely walk through the garden without being hit by some kind of pollinator or some uh, or butterflies. So I think I also like the fact that this agapanthus and agapanthus in general, um, other plants as well. I like that contrast of the strappy foliage, even when they're not in bloom with the gray uh, foliage of the shrub of the Budlia. I just think it's really beautiful. And the color palette, you've shown it here, is the same color palette if you use some of the lavenders or grape colors in all of the Budlia tonal ranges. It looks so beautiful with that really fresh white. 
Um, I, I love this Agapanthus everwhite. There's one that is even more cold hardy called Indigo Frost in the Southern Living Plant Collection that I am really excited about because it can help segue um, into the winter and then back into the spring without dying out if your zone can't accommodate Agapanthus. And, you know, it's back to that, what scents do our butterflies attracted to? And boy, they're attracted to rosemary. And I think this one in particular is a little bit more cold hardy and seems to be able, if you give it a lot of good grit, seems to be able to tolerate soils that are a little bit heavier. Uh, but boy, do these attract the butterflies and, and, it, and, and over a very, very long period of time, it is, again, as I said earlier, to me, very important in the design of a garden that it be experiential as well. And there's nothing more experiential than the scent of rosemary when the sun hits it. Um, likewise with gardenias, the fragrance when, you know, those of us in the South, we have to really exploit the heat and the sun as much as we possibly can. And when you are in a garden that's got all of these fragrances, then I think that heat not only helps those fragrances exude into the garden itself, but also I think then enhances its ability to attract pollinators. So I think again, it's all of those different kinds of things. And if you're looking for a really great plant that has great texture, that has been award winning all the way across the pond. They're so excited about this Mahonia soft caress, if for no other reason that it can really handle the shade. And I love its blue, that kind of blue green delicate ferny foliage and the fact that it too will attract all of those pollinators, but in a way that's sometimes hard to do when you don't have a full sun landscape. And so this is a brilliant container plant, a brilliant landscape plant, and just really, there's nothing not to love here. Great. Thanks, Linda. And uh, next up, we have this, I believe this is Natalie. It is. Okay. So we have, I, I chose a little quick fire, panicle hydrangea, just to point out the fact that, um, you know, we can choose a lot of hydrangeas for our gardens. And there are two different types, right? There's the mop head and the lace cap type. You're going to find that in your uh, big leaf hydrangeas, your panicle hydrangeas, your uh, smooth hydrangeas. And this is a, a nice lace cap version. And what it means is inside of that hydrangea, you've got your fertile florets, the big showy, like white florets you can see on the left there or the pink ones as the... Uh, as the blooms transition throughout the year are the sterile florets. But the butterflies wanna get in there to those fertile florets and that's where they're gonna get their nutrition and the pollen and the nectar that they're searching for. So um, anytime you can find something that's a lace cap that's easier for any kind of pollinator to be able to reach, it's a great choice for your garden. So I chose Little Quick Fire because I know people love hydrangeas and anytime I think you can choose something like this lace cap it's a great choice. It's a nice small choice. If you don't have a lot of room, you can see it works great in a container or you can put it you know, straight in the ground. They're super hardy. They bloom on new wood. They couldn't be easier to grow. Um, and this one, be because it's named Quickfire, we have a few in this series, will bloom about a month earlier than other panicle hydrangeas. Okay, moving on. Um, <laughs> we're moving on now to Bloomerang Purpink, Lilac. Remember I talked earlier about having enough uh, sources of nutrition and enough attractors throughout the season. So if you want something that's going to be one of the first to bloom, of course, it's a lilac. Uh, the Bloomering series is our series of lilacs that bloom in the spring like a traditional lilac, take a rest, and then bloom again in midsummer. We call it purpink because the blooms are a little uh, kind of a, a mixture between pink and purple. Uh, but um, depends on how the light's hitting it, I think. But it's also our strongest rebloomer yet in the Bloomerang series. So uh, when you get that second bloom in midsummer, 
It's going to be a nice full bloom, that beautiful, classic, sweet lilac scent. We've already talked about the fact that butterflies do love a sweet scent, and this definitely provides that. It also provides a shape that, that uh, pollinators really like. They like those clusters. So when you see a butterfly bush, you're going to see those clusters of blooms, the, the inflorescence of all the individual blooms. Same with these lilacs. Each individual is a cluster with that nice little space in the center where they can get their uh, nectar from. Pur pink is three to five feet tall, two to three feet wide. USDA zones three to seven. I also chose Double Play Doozy because the pollinators go crazy for it. It starts blooming in midsummer, continues till frost. Double Play Doozy is a seedless, non-invasive spirea. Same with butterfly bushes. In some places, people might have trouble with spirea. In other place, places, not so much. But what makes it the fact that it's uh, seedless really, really interesting is most spirea have to be sheared to rebloom. They bloom on new wood, but you need to shear all those old flowers off to, to make it rebloom again. This does not. Because uh, it doesn't produce seed, it blooms, and it doesn't have that little voice in it saying, hey, um, we've already done our, we've already bloomed, we're done blooming for the year. Um, it doesn't have any idea, and it just starts pushing up new flowers through the old seed heads. Beautiful dark green foliage with tinged with burgundy in the spring, an absolutely gorgeous uh uh, Spirea japonica, Spirea, that was the um, uh, the shrub of the year last year, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yes. yep. And um, this one is a nice small size too, right around three feet tall and wide. And then I, I, one of my very favorites is uh, Sugar Shack Cephalanthus or Button Bush. I do want to point out, if you're trying to create a, some, a really nice area that's hosts for butterfly, try grounding it in some native plants. And this is a native species. Uh, find things that are native to your area, especially if you want to attract uh, those butterflies that are regional and native to your area. And um, Button Bush is a great choice. Um, it has such a huge hardiness range. Um, Sugar Shack is hardy all the way uh, down to zone four and uh, up to zone 10. So it's got a very wide hardiness range. Um, what makes Sugar Shack special is not only its smaller size, it's only four to five feet tall and wide, which is small for a button bush, but you can see when the flowers, you get that beautiful white kind of Sputnik looking white flower that the uh, pollinators go crazy for. But afterwards, um, the fruit that's left behind a lot on a lot of butter bush, butterfly bush or a lot of um, cephalanthus, they can be like a a dark kind of muddy red or a green. And these are a bright red um, flower head that's left after the flower is completed. So that gives you more of a full season of interest. So that is Sugar Shack Button Bush. Thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, Tim, you're up next. Wonderful. Whoops, Whoa. I went too fast for you though. <laughs> um, I am, this is one of my favorite plants. This is the Bellini series of Lagostromia or crepe myrtles. These are not trees, obviously. They are flowering shrubs and they only get about two, maybe two and a half foot tall by two and a half foot wide. What I'm thrilled with is they're hardy to zone five. They're going to perform just like a butterfly bush. So you, it'll it'll die back to the ground in the over the winter and come back uh, in the spring reliably. Uh, and you'll have flowers by the 4th of July that will last all the way through till uh, till frost. And a great pollinator, uh, a pollinator attractor for bees and other and, and other pollinating uh, insects as well. Uh, but hardy zone five through, I believe, nine, maybe 10. Uh, but reliable bloomers, reliably hardy, just great, uh, uh, great flower show in the landscape. This is our new introduction for uh, this year called uh, it's a it's a new yellow knockout called uh, Easy Beezy. So, yes, very much a pollinator uh, friendly plant. Um, lots of uh, continuous yellow blooms throughout the uh, throughout the growing season. Uh, also with fragrance and hardy to zone four just like uh, the original Sunny Knockout. So easy beasy. It's going to be a little bit smaller than Sunny Knockout. It's going to be in the four, four to four foot range or four to four foot by four foot as opposed to the five to six foot range. Um, and I, from what I can tell, it actually blooms more than Sunny Knockout did. 
Um, so again, another great uh, uh, pollinator friendly plant. Um, show some love to trees as well, especially for early pollen for uh, for those for for bees early in the season. And this is a new introduction for us called uh, uh, Garden Gems Amethyst. This is a dwarf um, uh, red bud, uh, hardy uh, zone uh, hardy in zone five. Um, Probably only get about 12 foot tall. Actually, it grows about as tall as you stake it. Uh, great purple foliage and great uh, um, um, pink, pinkish purple flowers in the, in the spring. And then for a native, uh, hibiscus head over heels, uh, the perennial hibiscus. Um, all of them have kind of a little bit of a burgundy-ish color uh, to the foliage. Uh, uh, with the green and desire has a really, really dark burgundy flower, but, but great, uh, great for uh, attracting hummingbirds as well as other pollinators and hardy to zone four. Great. Thank you, Tim. And Laura, I think it's your turn to wrap us up with uh, an additional four varieties. Yeah. Um, so the first ones that I wanted to talk about are our Achillea. So we have two different series, the Firefly series and the Sassy Summer series. Um, both of these are a little bit taller, Achillea or Yarrow is the common name. Um, but what makes these nice is that they have very, very strong stem strength. So even though they get up to about two feet in height when they're in bloom, uh, these are going to be very strong stems that aren't going to lodge or flop open. Um, the main differences on the two different series is just the colors that are available. So we have everything from white to bright yellow to a couple of my favorites that are pictured here, uh, the Firefly Peach Sky, which kind of grades from yellows to peaches to more of a, an orangey color. And then of course the nice bright red, uh, summer sassy summer sangria. Um, and then asters, asters are a great, very late source of nectar for butterflies. So um, while the, the buddleia typically start in the summer and go on towards fall, these don't even start until early fall and continue on through fall a little bit longer than most of the other flowers in our gardens. And of course, these are also natives. So uh, these are both cultivars of the New England aster. So they are a native aster. Um, compared to the native New England aster that hasn't been selected uh, as these have, these are gonna be a much more mounded shape to the habit. Um, so not quite so wild and rangy. Um, and again, kind of like with the Achillea, we've selected these so that they don't uh, lodge and split open in the centers. Um, and then Virginia. Virginia is kind of a fun perennial that I think is a little bit more of an heirloom type perennial that not as many people are familiar with, but it is a great source of nectar for uh, butterflies. Um, these are plants that will do well in some light shade, but also in sun, as long as they're moist enough, they do like to grow um, in fairly uh, more moist conditions, not standing water, but definitely a wetter area or they'd be great in clay soils um, or they can take uh, morning sun, afternoon shade, if they don't have quite as much moisture available, uh, but just a nice uh, source of nectar for the butterflies. The foliage on these is big and beefy, um, typically up around a foot to a foot and a half with the foliage and then up to about two feet in height once the flowers start. Um, and these are nice and hardy, uh, typically zones four to eight. Great. Okay. So I what I'm going to Oh, Oops, sorry. I thought I had one more, but maybe not. Oh, did I? Let me let me go back here. Nephophia, maybe? Yes, you did. Yes, okay. you did. If I can get to it. Sorry. I'm using somebody else's computer and it just doesn't work quite the same as mine. There it is. There we are. Thank <laughs> you. Um, and yeah, last but not least, the Nephophia. Um, so this is another one where I feel like it's maybe something that people aren't as familiar with, or at least um, a lot of gardeners don't know the fact that some of these have been selected to be more cold hardy than they previously were. Um, so these are um, Nephophia, also known as uh, red hot poker plants. Uh, but the varieties that I'm showing here on the screen, these are both members of the Pyromania series. And these are hardy down to zone 5B. Um, so they do wonderfully here in West Michigan. Um, nice bright colors, and they do have that tubular shaped flower um, that can be attractive to both butterflies and hummingbirds. Um, butterflies will feed on tubular shaped flowers as long as the tubes aren't too long and deep for their proboscis. 
Uh, but these start blooming um, around the beginning of July and just continue to chug out flowers until fall. Um, and again, are just a nice source of nectar for the butterflies. Great. Okay. Now I'm not cutting you off, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for um, definitely including things that start in spring and go through fall, you know, especially in cooler climates, you want to make sure you have something for them throughout the entire time. Um, so it looks like we've got that. So we've got a little bit of time for some of the questions that came in. Um, quick question was, is there any Budlia for zones, maybe three or four? Or should we just recommend that they buy some of those smaller compact ones and put them in containers and use them as an annual? Good yeah, I, ha I had answered that. And they, they really are sensitive to cold. In fact, um, if you're planting a new Budlia and you're in zone five or zone six, uh, we actually recommend that you you don't even plant them close to when it's going to start getting cold outside. Plant them in spring or in the middle of the summer so they have time to have their roots get established into the ground. Um, so you're going to struggle, I, I think, a little bit trying to fit a Budlia into a zone four. Um, you can try it in a container, in a nice, well-draining container, and then try to keep it safe uh, throughout, you know, maybe slide it into your garage. Um, the thing to remember is whenever you plant, you know, a shrub in a container and you stick it in your garage, that doesn't mean it doesn't need water. Even though it's going dormant, it still needs to be watered about once a month. Um, but uh, if you really want to give it a shot, I say go for it. Put it in a container, put it in your garage, give it a shot. You know, there, if there's one thing we gardeners love doing is seeing how far we can push the hardiness or, you know, push a, push the shade tolerance or whatever of a plant. Yeah, good point. Um, and I see that you answered uh, the question about deer proof. And I wanted to, since all the attendees don't see the questions, um, Natalie had said that she finds butterfly bushes to be quite deer proof. And in fact, the Rutgers deer proof scale from Rutgers University marks them as rarely damaged. So yeah. They get, they get an A. They get an A. Yes. <laughs> and, and rabbit fruit. And rabbit. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and I think uh Linda on butterfly candy, is that one zones five through nine also? That was yes. And I would I'm I'll represent the South here. Um <laughs> It, unlike in Michigan and in colder zones where you might want to plant in the spring or whatever, in I would say in the South to get things really well established, fall planting is typically always superior because what in in the South we just typically have two seasons: we have before the heat and after the heat. And <laughs> so, so for us, what we're trying to do is constantly work with that phenomenon here. So, so fall planting in general, yes, you can definitely plant them in the spring. I don't want to dissuade anyone from doing that. But in general, we like to get our plants in the ground so that they can establish a really good, strong root system before they have to deal with sometimes very, very premature, extremely warm temperatures in the spring. Okay. Um, another question was about Budlia davidii. So are most of the ones that you guys were presenting, are they of that species or is it a interspecific or is it, it's just that we're breeding davidii to be less sterile, low seed set. Okay. Um, because somebody had said it's on their state watch list and, um, my suggestion again is just to look for the newer cultivars, you know, which uh, there was a shrub that we had a couple years ago and, you know, we didn't want to be crude, but it's like, yeah, pull out the big eight foot thing that's in your yard and let's just go with new varieties because you're going to get a lot more flowers, more compact with the Budlia, you know, you're going to get the low seed set, the, the sterile varieties. So that, that was our suggestion for that and for the Budlia also. And I think, unfortunately, our time is up. So I'm going to give each of you, um, do you want to do a wrap up? I think you guys have given some wonderful information here. I'm ready to go out and plant my garden for butterflies, even more so than what I already have. Um, so I'm going to start up there with you, Laura. Any any closing comments? Um, I would just say to, you know, make sure that you use lots of different types of plants. But, you know, butterfly bush are great. 
Uh, but we've all shown you several different options and there's a lot more out there. So include some of all of it. The more different variety you can have, the more likely you are to attract all different kinds of butterflies. And Natalie. Uh, I just want to speak really briefly again to the invasiveness issue, because I know that that's a that's a tricky subject. And um, when you're talking about things like the Lo and Behold series and the Mist series, those are allowed for sale in Oregon. So that's an area that really has restricted the sale. Um, they were, I think, on the forefront of restricting sale of invasive species. Um, so, it, you know, if you're having issues like that, we as breeders and as, as companies that sell these, we have to work really hard to get back on that list again. Um, we have to really, really prove that these are safe plants for them to sell in their states again. And um, we, you know, we put that work in because we want pe people that want these plants to be able to grow the safe cultivars. We don't want people smuggling them in or anything like that. So if you want those or if you want anything that goes with it, uh, we have a lot of shrubs on provenwinnerscolorchoice.com. If you go to provenwinners.com, there's a feedback line. You can ask questions there. You can send your pictures in there. So, um, you know, I loved uh, having Linda here to talk about the South versus the North. Uh, there's so many different ways you can garden and um, we want to help you every step of the way. Great. And Linda from the South. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think in the South, particularly in Oklahoma, our challenge is just to be successful in the garden. And so when you look at some of these varieties that not only have been bred for things like not being invasive and for scale and for other issues, it's definitely worth it to pay a dollar or two extra to get a plant that has all of these benefits to them, but that also gives you a much greater likelihood of success. And I, I think that the quality of these plants speaks for themselves and, and for, you know, none of us like to fail. So to be successful gardeners that, that can create beautiful habitats, not only for ourselves, but for our insect wildlife and, and other wildlife as well, it's just imperative that we really look at these kind of options. Great words. Okay. And Tim, since I was so rude to you and didn't let you in on time, <laughs> you will never forgive me for that. Sorry. Um, we will give you the last word then. You know, um, the only other thing I can add is when you're planning your garden and you're, and you're looking to landscape and you're looking for pollinators, don't forget a full season of bloom or at least, you know, three out of the four. Look for things for early spring. Make sure you're feeding uh, plants or planting plants are going to bloom later into the fall so that uh, the pollinators are, are are getting that food source when they need it. And at times that you may, they may not have a lot of options when it comes to uh, finding the nectar and finding, finding food sources. All right. So our last word was a big hurrah for our butterfly friends. Let's, let's go do something for them. Okay. Let's well, Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all the participants. This was this was wonderful, very informative and inspirational. <laughs> so with that, we say thank you and we'll see you on our next webinar.